Sten, welcome back to the show. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful as usual. Nice. That is very happy to hear going to me. So we had a very interesting discussion last week when we first stumbled on the concepts of financial independence, something that I believe everyone should aspire to because who doesn't want to be independent? Certainly me and certainly you too since you have gone this path, so to speak. So I think we should start a little bit on where we left off. So could you maybe, what could you say, Tell us, for those who haven't listened last time, briefly what we spoke about and also kind of lead in us to a topic that probably would be more convenient to talk about after the recent discussion. Yes. So basically the ins and outs of FIRE, just the financial independence part, really, because I think both you and I, as mentioned in the last episode, are not really that interested in just sitting on a beach and drinking alcohol. We rather focus on the financial independence to do more meaningful work and then thinking about how to reach financial independence. That's really the key. Yeah, exactly. But the funny thing is that I live very close to the beach, but I don't drink alcohol. So <laughs> that's something that probably can be, uh, you say, decoupled from classic narrative. But I get what you mean. Instead of chasing a mirage, it's better to consult what you have instead than maybe what to cut. So with that, I want to actually go into the savings rate because you can probably enlighten us a little bit of what the savings rate means to basically make sure to amplify it to get independence faster. Yeah, so savings rate is essentially how much of your current income are you saving and how much uh, are you not saving, i.e. spending every month. So your spending is everything that you do that costs, even if it's a yearly cost. For example, if you have a monthly card for your bus ticket, then it's a monthly expense that you break down into your yearly cost. Even if you, and even if you have a car that you don't spend that much money on, you still have to count on average how much will it cost per year to own it. And then think about when you work, how much money are you actually able to save on a yearly basis? Yeah, exactly. And then that's actually something that uh, one should have in such a perspective because I can I confess that, and I think it's common for a lot of people that whenever it's like, okay, pay this much for a year, then it's like, okay, I pay this and I don't need to worry about it. But the thing is, if you kind of see like, okay, this is how it's going to cost in a month, then you get like the whole picture, like, okay, this is how it's going to contribute percentage-wise rather Rather than some kind of one-off cost. So yes, that's something you're agreeing with as well. And uh, that's something that uh, would be considering very, very important to keep in mind later, so to speak. And um, it's very important to get the one-off costs, as one might call it, instead of having this, what you say, uh, mistreatment of it. Because it's easy to say, like, okay, it's more of a one-off thing and I can just get away with it. But no, maybe you should calculate it in the budget as well, together, together with all the month costs to get the more realistic picture in order to not delude yourself. Yeah, I agree. I think it's very easy to look at your current month or to look at your previous year uh, and you can get very wrong impression of your savings rate doing that. I think it's one of the key issues with your saving rate is that your saving rate will continue to change and you can have a big impact on how to change it. Looking at what are your biggest expenses that you're not really thinking about that you could either share with another person, your housing, your subscriptions, your travel expense, those things that actually make a big impact. So not just eating lunch with a friend once a week. That's, of course, that's an expense that you might be able to decrease, but you still have to eat. But the cost of housing you could easily have if you just change your mindset about how to live. And that could actually mean that if you have a saving goal that is quite ambitious, you could easily have the time it takes to reach that goal by looking at those big expenses. Yeah. And uh, the what do you say? The most um, common question would then be like, okay, how much should I save? What is the ideal savings rate? I personally have went for 10%, like in an automatic way going into uh, financial assets and stuff. But is that too little or should one optimize for a more extreme version? Or is it more dependable? Because I think many people could think like, okay, but you talk about savings rate, but how much should I really save in order to get what I want? So what's the standard? I think it really depends on where you are in life. If you just start to think about uh, retirement because you're 50 years old and thinking of retirement because people bring it up and then you might have some savings that actually means that if you just decrease your current cost you actually could retire now or if you're a student thinking that I want to have a high paying job so that I can then quickly save up 
money by just living as a student for the rest of your life. And then you could save up in 10 years, theoretically, if you want to keep living as a poor student. Uh, so it really depends on where you are in life and what kind of expenses you already have. But would you agree that um, for many people who are just like starting out to kind of define their baseline and say, okay, this is my minimum cost and what how it looks like right now, it seems like I can only save 10%. But when they earn more, then they can increase savings rate. So they are still living on that baseline, but the savings rate increased. So to not have a severe cut in the beginning and basically kind of have a more effortless way into the fire. Would you agree that that could be a very good start to start with a lower savings rate and gradually increase as you get more money, basically? Yes, definitely. Because I think personally that it's good to be really aware what baseline is. And as you said, probably <laughs> Dr. Steen over several times already, that totally depends on people. And uh, if I could just go on, on a rant real quick. Uh, the other day I was on uh, uh, YouTube YouTube, of course, and I saw like many controversies about these so so called financial gurus or scammers that uh, promise it's like okay you're going to like pay so much for this course and it usually is a very a lot of money to have basically been tricked because they are so into that promise of you're going to achieve the wonderland on uh, in terms of like all the lavish things that uh, they promise you and I find this quite uh, outrageous because first of all it's a totally scam and that's more outrageous enough but the other thing is like okay why are you expecting so much when you could you just be happy what we have i mean you could save so much both in terms of like money and also in terms of mental sanity but just reset your expectation and that's probably a very strong incentive to start with the financial independence retire early already from the get-go to have the mindset to say like okay i'm not fulfilled i have to buy this course no I have everything and I can be even more independent. So that's just my rant because I normally don't get frustrated, but I was a little bit frustrated when I heard like some kind of what you say, scary stories of people getting tricked. So I believe that financial independence could be an antidote for that. So what are your comments? I'm not sure. <laughs> Hard to add. But would you say that you're in agreement with me so far? Yeah. Because um, one thing I want to ask you as well, when we have talked about uh, saving straight as well, because it's very easy to say oh you save so much but saving can have many different flavors for instance like 401k savings or stock market or housing so could you just have a little bit of a walkthrough on what different means of savings are what different types of savings are and the benefit and disadvantages are maybe to maybe stop talking from my side i don't know <laughs> so go ahead so your question is uh, how what can to what kinds <laughs> yeah exactly what kinds of savings are there so i think investments is really what you're asking them yes exactly Exactly. Uh, clarify, do you want like how to save save things that you're currently wasting money on or invest money that you have over? So let's say that um, if I have 10% each month, what kinds of investment would be the most uh, popular in terms of alternatives? Because they could be both in terms of uh, savings fund, but they could also be more stock market and also more real estate. One has the opportunity to do so and also uh, even cryptocurrencies as well. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about them. Yes. Yeah, so when it comes to the question of how to invest the money you save when you increase your savings, it really depends on your time perspective and your risk willingness. If you're willing to uh, save for the next 20 years to retirement and you want to have a lot of money when you retire, the best thing you can do based on how history has shown is to have most of it on the stock market and possibly some of it in your uh, housing in that you own your own apartment so that you don't have to spend so much on rent. So those two things would be the biggest uh, uh, investments for most people wanting to save for a 20 year period because on the average, the stock market double in about eight years, which is more than any other investment uh, does that has a similar risk. If you want to increase your risk, uh, you basically have to take uh, all the kind of stock investments, like higher risk stock, which I wouldn't recommend for people who want to do it just as a saving, but it could be uh, enjoyable for people to see it as an, a hobby. But for most people, investing in a good place where you want to live for the next 20 years, so owning your own uh, place, that would be your biggest investment early in life. And then whatever money you save up for that, 
or whatever money you have over after owning that, paying that cost uh, would be in essentially mutual funds. So index funds, funds that basically own the entire stock market. Those would be the biggest uh, 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 the biggest assets to own if you have a 20 year perspective. If you have a shorter perspective, for example, say that you're currently a student and you're saving up money to own your uh, own place, then maybe you don't want to wait for a long time before you buy your own place. And having money in the stock market as you're about to buy a place is very high risk. So then you actually might want to have most of your money in basically a bank account while you save up enough money for, to buy an apartment. Yeah, so what I get is like, okay, the more perspective ahead, the more risk you can take there. And that's usually the common standard as well. So let's take a very hot topic question. What are your opinions on NFTs, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other kinds of uh, cryptocurrencies? Yeah, so I think that all investments are a, a complementary risk. So for example, if you own a piece of gold, uh, you never know for sure what the price of gold will be tomorrow. You can only look back in history and say that based on history, uh, people will want it tomorrow because it has these unique properties. When it comes to newly created valuable things, for example, Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, it has short history and you cannot really say the price of uh, something that has such a short history. You cannot uh, estimate the price tomorrow or on a longer term uh, for Bitcoin, for example. And anyone who tries have been wrong so far. Uh, but you can still say that owning just gold would be a high risk than owning a little bit of gold, a little bit of uh, the housing market, a little bit of uh, many stocks. So having an index fund where you own thousands of stocks is much safer than having one good stock for most people. Because of course, even a good stock can have a bad year and even a good stock can go bankrupt. Yeah, exactly. So if I understand correctly, it seems like you could pretty much go into the NFTs as long as you would not end up going bust because of the high volatility and stuff. Yes, I would say that when it comes to NFT, that's actually even shorter time history uh, than, for example, Bitcoin or and most other cryptocurrencies. And it's even less clear why it would have any value in 100 years. It seems like it shouldn't have any value in 100 years. And therefore, it's unclear why it will have a value in even 10 years. Yeah, exactly. So I guess time will tell whether it's fad that many in one camp says, or it's, it's a future, yeah. the other. Yes. So it's, I think inter it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's yeah. interesting with NFTs, for example, an NFT of uh, a painting, let's say Mona Lisa, because it's one of the world's most famous paintings. Uh, an NFT of that might have a lot of value. And you could also say that owning the Mona Lisa would be a good investment. But if you actually look on most paintings, essentially all paintings that have existed for 100 years, if you could go back uh, 50 years uh, and buy them, uh, it wouldn't be a good investment compared to buying uh, the index fund at the same time. So stock actually overperform most paintings uh, over such a long time period of 50 years. And expecting NFTs that actually is not clear why it would have a higher value in 100 years than it has now, then it's very hard to say that it will have a better performance long term than stock. Okay, so that's something we should keep in mind. And as some kind of a wrap up, we could probably have a very long answer to this question. But you advised me to look at a podcast in uh, several months ago called The Rich Together or Rika Tillsammans, as uh, the Swedish name is. And uh, of course, it's different for. Uh, different countries depending on uh, how the fiscal situation looks like and what options are. But one concept that was very foundational for them and I, I bring it up now because it's more of a more balanced act, and they call it the four buckets. So if you could explain to me again like you did beautifully off cam, uh, it would be very nice to kind of define what each bucket means and how to basically use them. Yes, so the four bucket prin uh, principle is essentially that you want to have different uh, mental a bucket that you think of your the money you have saved. Uh, you want to have one bucket that is quite easy to access. So everyone wants to have a wallet where you have some way of paying when you go out to uh, for lunch, for example. And you wouldn't want every single uh, dollar in your wallet to be invested. You want to have access to some money. So the first bucket is essentially money that you have easily accessible. Uh, I'm not saying your wallet. I'm saying money that you have on your bank account uh, or even multiple bank accounts. All that money together, that is your first bucket. The bucket of, oh yeah, say that you have a fridge that breaks down in uh, your apartment and you need to buy 
a new fridge tomorrow. Then you want to be able to not have to go out and sell your stocks on the stock market just to buy a fridge. So that's your first bucket. So Essentially, is... your living expense. All right. So what is the second bucket then? Yes. Yeah. So the second bucket is money that you don't need this year. Money that you might need when you buy your next, uh, if, you, if you're currently renting and you want to buy an apartment. That could be your second bucket. The bucket where it shouldn't decrease quickly in value. It shouldn't be invested on the stock market because this is money you need for a big investment. Uh, that could be a small bucket or a big bucket depending on where you are in your current yeah. investment situation but for most people it's not really a big bucket unless you're currently thinking of uh, buying a, uh, an apartment and then your third bucket this is really the money make so this would be the bucket that once you have a, a big uh, uh, living expense bucket once that one is filled and once you have filled your second bucket then all the money that you get after this you should be put into this third bucket and that's really the bucket that we want to grow as quickly as possible when we're talking about fire it's the bucket that you don't need the money in the next five years and therefore you can have a higher risk and you should then invest it in things that have a higher expected reward for example, an index fund, or if you prefer, you could have different new, uh, investment companies like Berkshire Hathaway is a good example of a company that do the only thing they do is try to make a better investment than the average person. And then the fourth bucket, that bucket is essentially something that most of us don't need, but something that we end up doing because uh, once you once you start learning about investing, you find that you want to learn even more. And one way to learn more is to put uh, some money into the fourth bucket, your investment bucket, your spec speculative investment bucket. So the speculative investment bucket is essentially stocks that you want to buy, but couldn't really motivate buying them by having them in this third bucket because they are too high risk. And you could say that this bucket is unnecessary. And I would say that for most people, this bucket is completely unnecessary unless you want to learn about the stock market or other kind of investments that you're interested in. Say that you have uh, a friend that has a company that you think is uh, undervalued and you have some way of helping them out, then you could give them a loan. And that could be considered a safe investment investment or it could be considered a high risk investment and even if it seems like a low risk investment it usually is a high risk investment that you first realize so that's why this fourth bucket is really these kinds of investments so, um, i guess the follow-up question would be then be how much should you balance or is it more in uh, in, uh, in light of one's perspective and i want to give another questions because i guess the first one will be quite short so if one could summarize each bucket with either one or a few words the first one would be one cash two emergency fund three stock market and four bitcoin maybe or is it too simplistic so now we got two questions i would replace number four with uh, in stocks actually so number three is essentially mutual fund safe investments and it shouldn't be one mutual fund that is just 10 stocks it should be a mutual fund that is hundreds or even thousands of stocks so i think uh, bitcoin and those investments would really be uh, a tiny proportion of the fourth bucket all right so it's more of a what you can say a little part of the fourth bucket but uh, to um, come back to the other question how much you balance it i guess that depends on where you are in life as well yes so as we were saying before if you're a student who have 20 years to retirement or if you're a 50 year old who have five years to retirement that's a very different kind of situation and that is something we could conclude for this episode today so basically have the general theme like okay it's a little bit different for everyone depending on your life circumstances but if you have some kind of a framework of this is what these kinds of money machines can go depending on how much risk you want to take or how much reward you want to get as well then you can basically calibrate to your own uh, will or whatever is the most intentional from your end and uh, would that be a very great summary of this episode still yes i agree and i think uh, next episode we should probably make a calculation to give an example of how much it actually matters where you look at the saving rate yeah exactly i think that we could go even deeper in the next episode and as i probably warned you in the first episode this is going to be a, a long topic because the end is the expert and uh, i want to uh, make sure that we got everything what he knows in this week so you have all saturdays think about whenever you want to feel more financially independent so next week will be more calculations examples both in extreme cases or in more normal cases and i look forward to that episode but before that i want to say thank you so much for partaking once again thank you